Hey there, I'm Larissa from Beekeeping Made Simple and this video is about what you do not want to see in the hive. And ultimately what I'm trying to do with this video and a few other of my YouTube videos is answer the question, what exactly is the role of the beekeeper and what are you doing when you open your hive? Because there should always be a purpose to opening a beehive. Now this video though is about problems within the hive. All the kinds of things you do not want to see I'm going to talk about um, how you know what it is. Then I'm going to explain to you what you do if you do see it in the hive and ways that you can prevent this from happening in the future. So I'll talk about pests, other problems, and I'll have the timestamps listed below if you need to you know, go to a specific problem and you know what the problem is already. And don't forget, if you want to just have all of this information that I have scattered around my YouTube videos, plus more in a website that you can access whenever you want to easily, check out my online beekeeping class at Beekeeping Made Simple. And there's a link to that below with a promo code so that you can get 35% off. First of all, I'm going to address small hive beetle. That is a problem that you really want to keep an eye out for if you live in an area where there are small hive beetles. Small hive beetles are especially a problem in the warmer climates, like here where we do not have a frost, and so the hive beetle population just grows and grows and grows. You will see hive beetles in your hive, the adult beetles, they're black. This is what they look like, and it is fine to see adult hive beetles walking around your hive. Often they will be under the lid or on the bottom board, uh, especially when you take the lid off. Then they'll be scurrying around because they were probably trapped in the crevice and guarded by one of the bees. And then when the lid came off, that guard bee was distracted and all those hive beetles got out. That is nothing to be alarmed about. That is normal. I see that all the time in my hives. You can put traps in your hives to keep that population down, but those traps don't really keep all hive beetles out. They just kind of um, keep the population down. What you need to be uh, keep an eye out for is um, small hive beetle slime and the larva in your hive. So this is what small hive beetle slime and larva look like. They have a shine to them. You will see these little white worms crawling around, slithering around. Um, the bees will be ignoring that area. And you cannot harvest the honey. The brood is no good. So when you see this in your hive, now it could be of various levels of this. It could be really bad or it could just be a small little patch somewhere in your hive. What you wanna do is get rid of all of that slime. So if you see small hive beetle slime or larva crawling around your frames, you want to remove it immediately. If you are using plastic foundation, you have to take the entire frame out. If you are using no foundation or beeswax foundation, you can simply just find the areas that have the slime and then add a few extra inches to that area and then cut that entire piece out of the frame. And, and pop that part out and you can put the rest of the frame back in. Now, to double check and make sure you're getting all of it, look at other areas, because sometimes there might not be slime, but there might be some larva crawling around inside the cells. So take your finger, poke it, and just look inside under some cells, and you're not sure, and just double check and make sure there aren't other areas of that frame and other frames that have larva that are inside the cell. So you wanna get rid of all of the small high beetle larva and the slime. So in addition to getting rid of all of the slime in the hive, you want to also double check your bottom board and the boxes because your frames might look okay, but down on the bottom or the walls of your boxes could also be some slime. So really check that bottom board, swap it out even for a three quarter inch piece of plywood that's the size of your bottom board. Just make sure that you prop open the lid a little bit or drill a three quarter inch 
circle hole into one of your boxes on the hive so that you have an entrance for the bees. Um, if your bottom board had the entrance included in it. Other thing you wanna do is consolidate the hive as much as possible. So any frames that have brood on it, keep that in the hive. If there's no small hive beetle slime on it or larva crawling around on it, you wanna get rid of everything else except for one to two frames of honey. Now, if you have one to four frames of brood, just keep one frame of honey in there. If you have five to eight frames of brood, keep two frames of honey in there. Now, if your brood frames are like half brood, half honey, then don't put as much honey in the hive. You just wanna leave them enough food to sustain the hive and no excess that is just going to require the bees to have to guard and protect from the hive beetle. The other thing you want to do is take out the excess pollen. There's gonna be pollen on your brood frames in that little rainbow shape along with the honey up top. So take out any frames of pollen you have in there. So the hive is consolidated. Most likely your hive is going to be just one brood box and your lid and bottom board and you're going to take the rest away. Um, you want to put some small hive beetle traps into the hive so you can, in a pinch, go to any store and get unscented Swiffer sheets. Be very careful to make sure it's unscented. Once I bought Swiffer sheets that just said nothing on them, so I assumed that meant it was unscented, but there was a scent to it and you actually have to find the box that says unscented on it. Um, you can use Brawny Dynamax towels. They also work, a plain old shop towel will not work. Check out the video, I have a link below to small hive beetle traps that work and how to use them. Then you're also going to wanna put, um, their beetle blasters also work too, but I don't think as well. Um, I also recommend putting a oil pan under your bottom board, a screen bottom board with an oil pan below the hive so that you have beetle traps on the top and on the bottom. But that's gonna require waiting for a beekeeping supply site to ship that to you. So that's not gonna be something you can do immediately, but also good to do. Ultimately, to prevent small hive beetle infestations, there's two things you really have to do. And it has nothing to do with beetle traps, though people love to figure out what the newest amazing beetle trap is that's going to, small their, that's going to solve their small hive beetle problem. When really, there are two things you need to do. One is control your varroa mites, because a hive that is strong and is not taken over by a parasite feeding off of them and spreading viruses among the hive. That is a hive that will grow, that will have a strong population and will be able to guard the hive against intruders like the small hive beetle. Now I'm speaking from experience, so please trust me on this one. I have seen apiaries lose thousands of hives and the only way they bounce back was through having a very strict varroa mite control treatment implementation whatever you call it second thing you want to do is make sure that there is not too much honey on the hive that the bees can't guard so time when this is really going to be a problem is later in the summer when and the fall when the hive population goes down but you're leaving honey on the hive so that they have something to go into winter with so you want to leave them what they need for winter and take the excess and harvest that. And you really wanna just keep an eye on them, put traps on it. If you have a freezer that you can freeze some of these frames temporarily, that's always great so that um, the bees don't have too much honey. And of course, if you have a small hive that's weak or is in nuke or is new, do not put too many frames inside the hive, especially frames with honey or drawn out comb because that is just going to be too much for the bees to be able to guard against and that is uh, just welcoming the beetles to go to those frames and to take over and to start laying their eggs.
All right, second on the list is wax moth. Now wax moth is probably one of the easiest things to keep out of the hive and to prevent an infestation of, but also something you just wanna keep an eye out for if you see it, get rid of it. This is what wax moth larva looks like. And that's what you're going to see in the hive, not necessarily the moth, but the larva. The larva is going to be chewing up the beeswax and you're going to see that webbing around it. The larva can be really small, like the size of small hive beetle larva, but then they get considerably bigger and look like these huge, fat, juicy, white worms crawling around. So if you see wax moth larva in your hive, what you wanna do is remove any of the honeycomb that is, um, has that webbing and is being chewed up and remove any honeycomb that has the larva on it. Because essentially what happened is that you probably introduce wax moth to your beehive by putting old used equipment into the hive. All you have to do is just freeze it first. Once you freeze it for a few days, you can put it in the hive and any wax moth larva that would have been there or wax moths that were hiding out in there would be dead and it would be fine. If you cannot freeze it, um, your other option is to just wash it really well. You take a hive tool, make sure you get into all the crevices, get rid of, scrape out all of the beeswax, um, any kind of honeycomb you might see in there, scrape the walls of it, you know, even get some of the propolis. Just make sure it looks clean and new. You can wash it, you know, like um, you don't need a pressure washer, but you can get one of the nozzles for your hose that has a strong pressure and make sure you just really wash all of the little cracks and crevices inside your frames and your boxes before you put them on your beehive and that will prevent wax moth from being inside your hive they can potentially get into a hive on their own but in order for that to happen and for wax moth to really cause damage to a hive that way, your hive has to be really weak and struggling and have frames of drawn out comb and almost no bees to guard it. And so if that is the case, wax moth is only one of many problems that that hive has. And, um, that is a hive that really is, is not going to survive. The third thing you do not want to see in your beehive are varroa mites. You've probably heard about varroa mites, whether you're treating, not treating. The way you know you have a varroa mite infestation, because you probably have varroa mites, unless you live in Australia or Samoa or a handful of other islands in the world that don't have varroa mites, your hive probably has varroa mites. Even if you just treat it, your hive still has varroa mites, just probably not a lot. So to know you have an infestation, you're going to start seeing mites on bees. N over 90% of the mites in a beehive are on the pupating bees in the cells. So when you start to see mites on the adult bees walking around the hive, you have an infestation. Also, if you see bees walking around with wings that look like someone took a little shredder and shredded them the way you do the string on balloons for a birthday party, that's a deformed wing virus and that is spread by varroa mites. That means you have a varroa mite infestation. If your bees abscond, which means that all of the bees take off in your hive, not half the bees or some of the bees, but all of them, maybe a handful of bees are still left behind because they were out foraging when they absconded or they're robbing the hive but almost all of the bees are gone. That's called absconding. And absconding is often caused by a varroa mite infestation. Because again, most of the mites are on the pupating bees. So a way that bees 
try to deal with on their own varroa mites is by absconding and this is a real a last resort and often doesn't work because the hive is so weak they can't handle creating another hive but absconding is one thing that the bees will do um, another sign of a row mite infestation are aggressive bees uh, alternatively an incredibly weak hive that you've been feeding and other hives nearby are doing well but this hive is still weak they're still struggling they're still not growing they're not bringing in an excess of honey um, that is often a sign of a varroa mite infestation if you pull out drone comb the pupa from inside the cell of a drone cell and you see those little reddish brown ovals that's a varroa mite and if you are seeing you know pulling out 10 of the drone pupa and you're seeing mites on two or more of them you have a varroa mite infestation if you are seeing pupa that aren't capped and you are seeing the faces of bees staring back at you that is often the sign of a varroa mite infestation because that is a virus that can often be in the hive when they are infested but ultimately the way you know you have a varroa mite infestation is that you do a mite test the most accurate mite test is with rubbing alcohol and there is a link in the show description to how you can do a mite test you can use powdered sugar but your results won't be as accurate and if you have seven mites in this test or more, then you have a varroa mite infestation. Five is also an infestation, but seven is when it's getting really bad and can be starting to cause a whole lot of viruses and absconding and those really extreme sorts of problems. So I always recommend to people to one, do a mite test every single month to not just put treatments in your hive, but to know what your mite levels are, to know um, if your treatments are working, to know if you even need to treat so often, and to know what hives deal with mites on their own better than other hives. And so if you have an infestation, the best thing to do is to purchase a treatment and to administer it in your hive. If you're looking for organic treatments, you can use a, a variety of formic acid treatments. You can also use oxalic acid. Oxalic acid is administered either through a vaporization, which means that you have to purchase this from a beekeeping supply site. And it is a stick that you put the wood bleach on otherwise known as oxalic acid, and you put that in the hive, or you can dribble it in the hive. I personally prefer the vaporizing method. You can use Apigard. That is a great um, natural treatment. However, you cannot use it if it is too warm out. Same thing with formic acid. You cannot use it in the middle of summer when it's too warm out. Um, check on you know the directions before you're purchasing this stuff to see what when you can and cannot use these treatments before you go putting it in your hive. There is also Apovar and that is a chemical but it can be administered any time of year and you just put it in the hive and close it up and it often works really well. It has a very effective rate. A lot of beekeepers don't want to use it because they don't want to put a chemical treatment into the hive. Personally it's not something you want to put in every single month <laughs> or every single treatment. You don't want to use it. You can breed uh, mites resistant to this treatment. However, I don't completely see why people are so against using this stuff. It's not like toxic to the bees. It doesn't cause hives to go queenless the way formic acid does. It doesn't, um, it's, often more effective than oxalic acid when there's brood present um, and you know if you were sick uh, 
people don't like to just take antibiotics just for the hell of it. But if you were sick and you had an infection, you would take a strong antibiotic so that you could get better. And that's the way I see Apovar, although it is a strong chemical, sometimes that is what's needed to get the hive back on track. So when it comes to prevention for varroa mites, the best thing to do is one, to do a mite test on one of your hives, not all of them, every single month to know what your mite levels are. And the other one is assuming that you have a mite level of above three to put a treatment in, in the early mid spring before the honey comes in late summer. Once you take the honey off the hive to make sure that those baby bees that the queen is laying which will be your winter bees are super healthy before you close your hive up for the winter again because there will be lots of robbing in the fall and you will have a whole lot of mites again in your hive and for some people they might have to do it in the middle of winter from there continue to test your hives for mites and see if you can do some integrated pest management techniques to bring your mite levels down naturally or breed bees that bring their mite levels down naturally and you can start to take away some of these treatments and not have to treat so often. All right, this one is kind of an obscure one and one you probably won't ever see, even if you've been keeping bees for 40 years, but one to know about, and that is American Fowl Brood. American Fowl Brood um, is a bacterial disease. The brood will be stringy and have a foul smell to it. What you do if you see this is you burn the entire hive. You burn the boxes, the frames, the comb, and the bees unfortunately. You also should report this to your state apiary office. Uh, here in Hawaii what happens when someone rec um, spots fowl brood is that the apiary office has um, this email list and they will send out a thing to all the beekeepers on this email list notifying them that the fowl brood was spotted in the county and whereabouts in the county it was um i've never seen it i've never known anyone to have it however i have gotten two or three emails in the last 10 years about it being spotted somewhere in the county that i live in there isn't really so much you can do to prevent fowl brood however once you do spot it in a hive you want to get rid of that hive and all of the equipment and thoroughly wash your hive tools and um, protective gear thoroughly to not spread it to other hives. Okay, moving on. Next thing you might see that is not good is chalk brood. Chalk brood kind of looks like little pieces of whitish gray black chalk inside the cells where there should be brood. This is actually a fungus and um, you might not always see it in the cells, but you might see it on your bottom board because bees are pulling it out of the cells and then leaving it on the bottom board inside the hive or right outside the entrance on the ground. Now, it often goes away when it's warm and humidity goes down. So here where it is very humid, <laughs> that's that's where we're often seeing it we'll, we're seeing it in the super wet areas um, and it is really a sign of just poor genetics in your hive you can continue to clean the bottom board to get any chalk brood that's just hanging out inside the hive on the floor out to prevent it from spreading more inside the hive. And you can take out those frames that have chalk brood on it, or if you don't use foundation, you can cut out the sections with chalk brood. However, if after a few months, this is not clearing up on, their, on its own, that is a sign that these bees do not are not as hygienic 
as most honeybees are. You do not want to spread these frames to other hives because then you're just giving them this fungus. And of course, before you use any of the woodenware from this hive, make sure that you're cleaning that thoroughly as well. Next, ants. I'm addressing ants, but honestly, ants are often not a problem. They, you will see them in the hive, you will see them outside the hive, underneath the hive. Often they're not a problem, they're just taking advantage of a place to make a nest. Um, you can put your beehive, you can elevate your beehive, a little bit higher than it is. You can put it on gravel. You can put, um, you can cut the grass, make sure the grass is considerably shorter than you have been if you've been letting it get really tall. You can grease the legs of your hive stands, or you could put your hive stand legs in cups full of oil. But again, most ants are not causing harm to the hive. So don't be too quick to do these things unless you know that this is a kind of ant that can cause harm to the hive or you are seeing damage to the hive caused by ants. And then you can take these extra steps. Next up, tracheal mites. Tracheal mites are one of those things that I heard about, but I didn't even really know what they were, what to do about them for like the first seven years I was a beekeeper. <laughs> Tracheal mites are a microscopic mite. They're really hard to diagnose because you're not going to see them on the bees the way you see varroa mites. Often what you will see a sign of you having a tracheal mite problem is what they call K-wing. And that's when the wings are like disjointed and they create this K kind of shape. The wings project 90 degrees from the body or they're outward like a K shape. Um, it can often also cause excessive swarming and low activity within the hive. So if you're seeing those things, you can go to um, either your state apiary office, contact your local bee association, or if a local university has an entomology department, you can see if any of those places will um, diagnose tracheal mites for you. The only way to completely know that you have tracheal mites is by looking under a microscope. I have a link below how you would be able, what you would do if you did have tracheal mites, but essentially some people use menthol crystals, but you can also just make a patty with vegetable shortening and you put it inside the hive. When it comes to prevention, the only way to really prevent tracheal mites in your hive is to not swap beekeeping equipment among hives. Now I do, um, it's, it's kind of difficult not to, it's really the reason why you have multiple beehives is so that if one hive needs help, you're giving them help from another hive. But if you have a hive that is excessively swarming and is swarming when it really shouldn't be, or if you have a hive that's weaker or is kind of low population, um, some people will merge that hive with a stronger hive. And you, before you would do something like that and add that weak hive to a stronger beehive, you should really get it tested to make sure that they don't have tracheal mites. Um, un unless you know for a fact what that hive's problem was. And you know for a fact that it wasn't tracheal mites, but something else. Okay, another problem you might see within the hive is a queenless hive. So this is where we get into some of the beekeeping that can be a little a bit more detective work. Uh, but don't be scared. Don't be deterred by this. This is it's a part of beekeeping is doing this stuff. And you might not always be right, or you might not always find the problem, but it's, it's a part of the job. So signs that your hive is queenless is that you don't see any eggs in the hive. That's really a number one sign. You might see, um, I had a, a beekeeper that I worked with who had been keeping bees since he was a teenager. He was in his 60s at, when I was working with him. As soon as he took the lid off the hive, he knew that the hive was queenless. Um, so it often is like a, a different buzzing sound you might hear, which is something that you're just gonna get used to while keeping bees over the years and getting to know your hives. Um, it, often the bees might sound a little depressed because the queen does release a pheromone that encourages activity among the bees. So without that pheromone being released, the bees might be kind of like 
not very active, not doing as much. Um, they might be a little bit extra aggressive, have a bad temper, kind of depressed is sometimes how I describe it. So that's either a queen west hive or a really weak hive that's not really doing all that much. Um, and so for the weak hive, you might see some eggs, but very spotty, an egg, you know, like a quarter inch of empty cells and then another egg and another egg. Queens should be laying in a spiral pattern, cell after cell after cell. You shouldn't be seeing holes in the laying pattern. Now where the pupating bees are, the bees are hatching. So you will see empty cells among the capped brood, but among the eggs and larvae, you should not be seeing a whole bunch of empty cells uh, all around the baby bees. So if you're seeing that, you have a weak queen. If you're seeing absolutely no eggs, then you might have no queen. So what you want to do? Well, if you have no queen, first you want to check for queen cells. And if you want your, your hive to requeen, leave them, close up the hive, and don't open it up for about 20 days. <laughs> Because you want to give that queen enough time to hatch and go on her mating flight without you bothering her. You do not want to hold that frame upside down. Any frame that there might be a queen cell on, you do not want to turn that frame upside down. So when you're checking your hive and you're pulling this frame out, don't do this. You look at the frame and you can go like this to look at the other side if you really need to. Do not turn the frame upside down. Your queen might not be, be viable when she hatches if you do that. If this is a hive with poor genetics, maybe they've had a lot of chalk brood, maybe they've been weak for a long time. It's just a hive where you don't want that queen, then remove all the queen cells, shake every single frame. You wanna take that frame and just give it a really strong shake to get all of the bees off. You shake this over the beehive so the bees go in the box and then really inspect that frame and make sure that you are not missing any queen cells. Remove all of the queen cells, give them a few days, and then introduce a purchase queen into your hive. If you see the queen, but she's just weak, what you can do is feed them a one-to-one -one sugar syrup ratio. And that means just heating up one cup, one gallon, one quart, whatever you want of water heating it up to boiling or really hot, taking it off the heat and add the same amount of sugar to it. Whether one cup, one cup of water, one cup of sugar, one quart of water, one quart of sugar. Mix it all together, not powdered sugar, not agave syrup, not brown sugar, just plain white sugar. Add some, you know, honeybee healthy or whatever, um, essential oils that beekeeping supply sites sell to help the bees digest this syrup and give that to them for about a month and see if that helps encourage anything. You could also give them a small frame of honey um, and see if that helps to encourage the queen to start laying. If the other hives in the area are doing fine and that queen still isn't laying, you've done a mite test and they do not have a mite infestation, then I would recommend pinching the queen and letting them either make, no, don't let them make a new queen, buy a new queen and introduce her to the hive. Robbing. Robbing is sometimes you, something you will see at some point as a beekeeper. And it's, something you can do about it or you can not do anything about it and let the bees fight their own battles. It's up to you what kind of beekeeper you want to be. But what you will see is uh, your bees are going to be aggressive. They're going to be angry at you. They're going to be angry at the world. As soon as you take the lid off, they're going to be flying at your veil, trying to sting you. Um, you will see dead bees outside the hive and you will see bees like on the lid, outside the hive fighting, like rolling around trying to sting each other. That is often caused by robbing and it is going to happen when there's not a lot of flowers blooming, especially once there were a lot of flowers blooming and then now there's a dearth, which is what we call it when there's not a lot of food coming in. So 
This is often late summer, early fall, and if you don't have a lot of goldenrod in your area, that is a great fall flower to plant so that the bees can bring in some extra food. Doesn't make a very tasty honey, but that's okay because you're not gonna be harvesting this stuff. It's gonna be the extra food for the bees uh, in the fall. And it will help prevent robbing when you have all of this food sources around. But um, it's robbing is not something you will always see badly every single year, but some years might be worse than others. Maybe you just had like a really dry summer and so it just caused a lot of the flowers to die early on and the fall flowers aren't really popping up because of it. Um, and so you might see excessive robbing. And so that's just essentially bees stealing from each other. What you wanna do when you see robbing is you can put an entrance reducer on your hive. You can buy one or you can make one just with some little pieces of wood. You're essentially reducing the size of your entrance so that it's not the full entrance of your bottom board, but it's just going to be like, you know, a couple of inches. And so that will keep out a whole lot of robber bees that are trying to get in and it'll make it a lot of easier for the guard bees of your hive to guard the entrance. If you have additional entrances on your other boxes, you can plug them up with a cork. And if you have like, you know, holes and stuff in your boxes, you can tape them up with duct tape to keep the amount of entrances to a minimum. If you have like just an incredible amount of robbing, another thing you can do is put a thin wet sheet over the hive and that will allow bees to get in but will deter robber bees from the neighborhood. To prevent an excessive amount of robbing, in addition to planting flowers during those low nectar seasons, like the goldenrod that I mentioned, you do not want to leave honey frames with honey on it, pieces of honeycomb that you pulled out of the hive, or feeders outside the hive. Some people will just get one big chicken feeder and leave it outside their beehives. But what you're doing is you're not only feeding your bees, but you're feeding the neighborhood bees. And these bees and wasps, it's not just bees, but also wasps, will be attracted by this feeder and they're also going to smell the beehives in the area that are nearby. And so you are you're know, just pretty much sending out a little signal to all of the pollinators like hey there's free food here now this is not something that can easily be done but another thing to consider is where you're putting your beehives and is there a place that's better for them now i don't mean like put your hives in the northwest corner of your property instead of the southeast corner i mean would your bees be better off on a farm two miles down the road or if you live in the city, maybe they would be better off in, in another county, 30 minute drive down the road. If your bees are near a whole bunch of other bees and there's not a ton of food, there's gonna be a lot of robbing going on. And that was something that I came across here on the Big Island because there are tons of queen breeders here, especially in, on the west side in Kona and South Kona and I always struggled with finding places where my bees did well. They didn't die. <laughs> they didn't have rural mite infestations or small hive beetle infestations but very few of them got to be more than like a box or so of honey up above the brood and that was because there were too many bees in the area and those commercial apiaries are feeding their bees syrup because they're just looking to harvest the queens. And so what you might be finding is there might be beekeepers that are just offering pollination services or something. And so they might also be doing the same thing. They're just feeding their bees sugar so that they can get paid for the pollination services. But in the meantime, your bees are struggling because they are fighting to get food um, because there are so many other bees in the area. All right, so that's the worst of it in my opinion. If you're not seeing any of that stuff within your hive, pat yourself on the back. You're doing a pretty good job. Your bees seem to be doing well. And don't worry about all of the small stuff. Don't forget to check out my online beekeeping class at Beekeeping Made Simple. We also have some beekeeping t-shirts there to check out. And if you are thinking about becoming a beekeeper but not sure yet, we have a free PDF ebook that you can download at beekeepingmadesimple.com.